بسم الله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا يرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه We'll be going over inshallah a compilation and translation that I put together entitled Kashful Jahiliya Fi Ta'rifat Al-Itiqadiya Nadhrun Fi Ta'rifat Min Thalatat Al-Fool It is removing the ignorance concerning the definitions of terms related to creed. A close look at the terms found in Salatat al-Usul, the book, The Three Fundamental Principles of Islam. Years ago, a brother gave me the book, At-Ta'rifat al which is a definition of terms related to creed. Basad ibn Muhammad ibn Ali, Ali Abdul Latif. He gave it to me as a gift. It's a, uh, it's a compilation of comprehensive definitions of terms related to our, our, our Peter, our creed, by scholars of the past and present. I immediately realized the value of such a work as a tool to enhance my studies. Initially, I would incorporate the explanation of the terms within the book during the Akita classes that I teach here at the Masjid. As such, it became obvious that just as I was in need of understanding these terms in more detail, so were my beloved brothers. So I decided to take the terms from the classical work, Salatatul Usul, or the Three Fundamental Principles of Islam, by Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, and I decided to define them using the scholar's definitions found in, found in the compilation Ta'rifatul Itiqadiyya. However, I realized it became necessary to use other tools to complete this work, so I had to go to other sources. So the methodology we'll employ, inshallah, is I'll recite the original text of the three fundamental principles of Islam in Arabic and English, a small portion at a time. Then we'll select the terms and go over the explanations of them. So the book starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, ar-Rahman, the most merciful, as it's translated, ar-Rahim, the bestower of mercy, alam Rahimakallah, Ennahu yajibu alayna ta'allamu arba'i masail. No, may Allah have mercy on you, that it is obligatory upon us to gain knowledge of four matters. Al-Ula, Al-Ilm, wa huwa ma'rifatullah, wa ma'rifatu nabiyyihi, wa ma'rifatu deen al-Islam, dilla dilla. The first, it is knowledge, which is Ma'rifa, or we translate it as knowledge and awareness of Allah, knowledge and awareness of his prophet, and knowledge and awareness of the deen of Islam, along with the proofs. Athaniyah, a second, is al-amalubi, acting upon it. Athalitha, the third, is al-da'wa tu it's calling to it. Al-Rabia, the fourth, Having patience upon the harms that come with such a path. The proof is the saying of Allah the Most High. Allah says, by the time, surely mankind is in a state of loss, except those who have iman, faith, do righteous deeds, recommend one another to the haq, which is the truth, and what recommend one another to suffer, patience. That's Surah Al-Asr, that's the 103rd Surah listed in the Quran. Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, said, if Allah did not reveal to his creation any other hujja or proof or evidence besides the surah, then it would have been sufficient for them. So, so far, we'll stop and go over the definitions of these terms that we find in this section we just went over. So far, we have 12 terms that we'll go over. The first is Allah. Second is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. 
Third is al ilm knowledge. Fourth is ma'rifa, which we translate as knowledge and awareness. Fifth is nabi, which we translate as prophet. Sixth is deen, which we translate as religion or way of life. Seventh is islam, which needs no translation. Eighth is dalil, which is proof or evidence. Nine is sabr, which is patience. Ten is iman, which is faith. Eleven is haq, which is truth. And twelve is hujja, which is evidence of proof. As for Allah, Shaykh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al-Abad, Hafidahum Allah, said in his book, Mukhtasir Fiqh al al Husna, which is a summarization of his larger book, The Fiqh or the Understanding of Allah's Beautiful Names and Attributes. He said about the name Allah, All of the meanings of the beautiful names of Allah are intrinsically linked to this name and allude to it in a general manner. The beautiful names of Allah give detail and clarification to the attributes of ilahiyya, meaning that which acts of worship are directed towards, which are the attributes of loftiness, perfection, and magnificence. So it is the name that all of the beautiful names of Allah return to, and the name that all of the various meanings of the beautiful names of Allah are dependent upon. The most comprehensive and beautiful saying regarding its meaning is what has been transmitted from Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, that he said, Allah huwa dhul uluhiya wa khul, dhul uluhiya wal ubudiya ala khalqihi ajma'in. Allah is the one who possesses the sole right of worship and servitude over all of his creation. Meaning, he is the one to whom belongs the descriptions of loftiness, perfection, and magnificence. Because of that, he is therefore deserving of being turned toward and singled out specifically with bull, submission, khudul, humility, and inkisar, a feeling of brokenness or absolute vulnerability. The end of his quote. As for the names Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, Shaykh Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Muhsin al-Abbad, Hafidahum Allah, said in his book, Mukhtasr, Fiqh al-Asma al-Husna, he said, each of these two names indicate the affirmation of Rahma, mercy, as an attribute of Allah, the mighty and majestic. Al Rahman is the one who possesses Rahma as an attribute. Al Rahim is the one who is merciful to his slaves. So these two words indicate the perfection and expansiveness of the mercy that is an attribute of Allah. Everything in the creation is affected by traces of his mercy through the attainment of things that are beneficial, beloved, gratifying, and good overall. Also, everything in the creation is affected by the traces of his mercy, by him averting from those, them those things that are disliked, unfortunate, cause anxiety, cause one to take precautions, and are harmful overall. There is no amount of good that is obtained except through him. And there is no amount of evil that is prevented except that it is prevented by him. He is the most merciful of those who show mercy. That's the end of his quote. Also, I'd like to point out that in the explanation of Talatatul Uthul, of the Three Fundamental Principles by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al utaymi he mentioned a way that it makes it clear that Rahman means that Allah's Dhu Rahmatul Wasiya, that he possesses mercy, the expansive amount of mercy, or an all-encompassing type of mercy. And Rahim is Dhu Rahmatul Wasila, is that he is the one who is who possesses the mercy that is uh, connected to others or bestowed on others. As Allah says in the Quran, يُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْحَمُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَإِلَيْهِ تُقْلَبُونَ In Surah An-Kabut, that's the 29th Surah, in the 21st Ayat, Allah says, He punishes whom He wills and He shows mercy to whom He wills. And to Him you all will return. As for the term ilm or knowledge, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al utaymi said in his explanation of Talat al Rahimahullah, He said, knowledge is to comprehend the reality of a thing as it truly is with certainty. With regard to ilm al specifically, legislative knowledge, the Sheikh said in that same work, knowledge is separated into two types. 
ضروري inevitable and نظري speculative ضروري inevitable is that which is inevitably known in a manner that compels a person to comprehend it without investigation or seeking proof like the fact that fire is hot for example نظري or speculative is that which requires investigation and proof like knowledge of the obligation of having a proper intention before performing wudu Abu Ya'la rahimahullah said legislative knowledge is actual knowledge from the book the sunnah the consensus of the ummah meaning the consensus of the scholars and qiyas analogy according to one of these three principles as for the term ma'rifa which we translate as knowledge and awareness al hafiz ibn rajab rahimahullah said it consists of an idea or concept along with tasdiq affirmation in the heart so it includes knowledge and action which is the affirmation of the heart an idea or concept may be shared by the believer and the disbeliever whereas tasdiq affirmation in the heart is specific for the believer it is an action of his heart and something he has acquired Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he said knowledge which is combined with love for the thing that is known is ma'rifa as you can see with the phrase al-amr bil ma'ruf and joining the good wa nahyi an al-munkar and forbidding the evil so ma'ruf is what the heart loves along with knowledge of that thing knowledge which is known to be specific and determined may be intended with the word ma'rifa whereas ilm which is a type of ma'rifa is that which is known generally and completely the intent behind the word ma'rifa may be the thing that is known personally although the word ilm consists of both types in its root on a side note sheikh sali al fawzan hafizahullah he pointed out in his explanation at the last pulsu that the reason allah is not described with ma'rifa with this type of knowledge is because ma'rifa is acquired knowledge that was preceded by ignorance as for the term nabi or prophet shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah said a prophet is a human man who has had a legislation revealed to him but has not been commanded to convey it he also said when he only works by legislation and is not sent from allah to convey his message to anyone then he is a prophet ibn abdul is rahimahullah said they have mentioned the difference between a prophet and a messenger in a beautiful manner whoever allah has revealed divine information to if he was commanded to convey it to others then he is a prophet and a messenger and if he was not commanded to convey it to others then he is a prophet and not a messenger therefore the messenger is more specific than the prophet imam saadi rahimahullah said messengership necess necessitates conveying the message along with everything that it has come with from the legislation the minute details and the main portions prophethood necessitates Allah inspiring him and distinguishing him with the sending of revelation to him so prophethood is between him and his lord while messengership is between him and the creation as the, for the term deen which we translate as a religion or way of life Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said the deen is ta'a obedience ibadah worship and khulu character or natural disposition so it is the required and persistent state of obedience that has become customary and natural as ahmad al-ankari rahimahullah said deen is a technical term for the divine ordinances that motivate those who possess intelligence to that which is good he also said the deen is general obedience that a person is compensated for by a law with rewards as for the term islam Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah said Al-Islam huwa al-Islamu lillahi bit-tawheed wa al-inqiyadu lahu bit-ta'a wa al-bura'atu min al-shirki wa ahli Sheikh al-Islam said it is to submit to Allah with tawheed and to yield obediently to him and to free oneself from shirk and its people in other words to submit to Allah with recognizing that he is the sole lord creator provider and that he is the sole one turned to and worship to yield obediently to him and to free oneself from those who ascribe partners with him and from ascribing partners with him in and of itself 
Qatada rahimahullah said, Islam is the testification that none deserves to be worshipped except Allah while attesting that whatever has come from Allah. It is the deen of Allah that he himself has legislated and sent to his messengers with. And that which has been indicated by his awliya, his close allies, he does not accept nor give rewards to any other religion. Abu Aliya, rahimahullah, said, Islam is ikhlas, sincerity to Allah alone and worshiping him without any partners, establishing the prayer, paying the obligatory alms, and carrying out the rest of the obligations that follow. As for the term dalil, proof, or evidence, Ibn Muflish said, Dalil is that which shows a strong connection of sound evidence to the desired topic. Zakaria al-Ansari, rahimahullah, he said, that which the knowledge of it necessitates the knowledge of something else. Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Dalil is legislative proof of two types, intellectual and traditional. Intellectual proofs are that which is pro proved by the legislation by way of logic. Traditional proofs are that which is proved solely by the text. As for the term sabr or patience, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Sali al Utaymi rahimahullah said, linguistically, meaning according to regular usage, patience means restraint. However, according to the legislation, meaning the way we use it religiously, it means controlling oneself regarding three things. One, controlling oneself upon obedience to Allah. Two, controlling oneself from the prohibitions of Allah. And three, controlling oneself over Allah's preordainments he finds painful. These are the categories of patience mentioned by the people of knowledge. He said the first matter for the individual to be patient upon obedience to Allah is because obedience is heavy on the soul and could be difficult upon the soul. It may as well be hard on the limbs such that the individual could be feeble and weary. Likewise, it may involve some difficulties in the aspects of wealth, such as in the manners regarding the zakat and hajj. So acts of obedience may involve some stress for the soul and body, and therefore they require patience and endurance. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, that's the third surah in the 200th ayat, Ya ayyuhu al-lazina amanu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. O you who believe, have supper, have patience, and endure and be more patient, meaning than your enemy. And rabit, rabit is a term that means guarding your territory by stationing an army unit permanently at the places where the enemy can attack you. The second matter, patience regarding the law's prohibitions by the individual's avoidance of, a, of whatever a law has forbidden him from. This is because the soul inviting to evil encourages sins. Thus the individual will restrain his soul. For instance, lying and cheating in dealings, unlawful consumption of wealth through usury or other means, illicit sexual intercourse, drinking alcohol, stealing, and similar other numerous sins. The individual should hold back himself and not commit these sins. This certainly requires endurance and restraint in soul and personal desires. As for the third matter, patience over the preordainments of Allah, he finds painful because Allah's preordainments may be suitable, suitable for the servant or they may be painful for him. As for the term Iman, faith, Ibn Jarir, Rahimahullah said, Iman is a comprehensive term used to affirm belief in Allah, his books, and his messages. That affirmation is confirmed through action. Also, the scholars have explained that Iman is a statement of the tongue, belief in the heart, and action of the limbs. It increases with obedience and dis decreases with disobedience. Imam Sa'adi, Rahimullah, said, Iman is certain attestation and confirmation of everything Allah and his messenger informed us of. Actions of the heart, and following that, is actions of the limbs. The difference between Iman and Islam. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, When mentioning Iman and Islam in the same context, Iman implies inward statements and actions, while Islam implies outward statements and actions, according to the correct statement of the people of knowledge. When either of these two terms are mentioned alone, they are synonymous. 
In such a case, Iman is statements and actions, inward as well as the outward aspects, and likewise is the case with Islam. In other words, that if you mention Iman and Islam together, they mean opposite, meaning one means inward and one means outward uh, actions. Whereas if you mention them alone by themselves, then they are synonyms. They mean the same thing. As for the word hop, truth, Ibn Khuzayma, Rahimahullah, said, the classification of the term haq is applicable to everything that is correct and just in rule, action, or statement. If we are referring to the name al haq it is from the names of our Lord, the Mighty and Majestic. However, none of Ahlul Qibla, meaning the people who turn toward the Kaaba in prayer, have been prohibited by the scholars from applying the word haq to everything that is just and correct. Zakaria al-Ansari, Rahimullah, said, al haq is Allah, the Most High, and it may also apply to the rulings that are, are in agreement with the truth. This term applies to statements, beliefs, ways of life, and methodology with regards to what those things may include of the truth. Abu Madhafar al-Sam'ani, Rahimullah, said, it is placing a thing in its appropriate place according to what wisdom necessitates. He also said haq applies to two situations. One of them simply means correct or it means oblig obligation. It is said haqun alika. It is obligatory upon you that you do such and such. Ibn Abil, Rahimullah said, It is a name that combines between confirmed existence, required obligation, and countering falsehood. It is that which is correct in statement and belief. As for the term hujja, which we translate as evidence or proof, I'll bring a section called Qiyam al hujja and although which means establishing the proof. And although this is not what is meant by Imam Shafi's statement when he said in the main text, if Allah had not sent any other hujja proof or evidence besides this surah, man surah asr, it would have been sufficient for the creation. Even though this this is not what we're going over here. I'm still bringing it due to the benefit of this discussion in relation to the word hujah, proof or evidence. Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, The proof of Allah has been established upon the servant by the sending of the messenger and revealing the book which reaches the servant while he has the ability to gain knowledge of it. So it does not matter whether he actually gains knowledge or remains ignorant. Everyone who has the capability to gain knowledge and awareness of what Allah has commanded and prohibited, prohibited, yet does not learn about it, then the proof is considered to have been established upon him. Ibn Hazm, Rahimullah said, proof is considered to have been established upon a person when it reaches him in a manner that cuts off any excuse. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah said, the proof of Allah that has been conveyed by his messengers is considered to have been established by the people's ability to learn it. It is not a condition that the pro proof of Allah, the Most High, is actually learned by the people who are being called to it. It is for this reason that disbelievers refuse to listen to or contemplate the Quran, and they are not... It, wait. It is for this reason that the disbelievers' refusal to listen to or contemplate the Quran is not considered a factor that has prevented the proof of Allah, the Most High, from being established upon them. Likewise, their refusal to listen to that which has been conveyed from the prophets and the dictation of narrations that have been narrated from them does not prevent the proof from being considered to have been established upon them when they have the ability to obtain them. Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah said, From that which is known is that establishing the proof does not mean that a person actually comprehends the speech of Allah or his messenger in the same manner that Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, comprehended it. Rather, when the speech of Allah or his messenger has reached someone, and they are free from having a valid excuse from accepting it, then that person is considered a kafir, a disbeliever. Qal al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Bukhari, may Allah have mercy upon him, said, Bab al-ilm qabl al-qawli wal-amal. He said, chapter, knowledge precedes speech and action. And the proof is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
فاعلم انه لا اله الا الله واستغفر لذنبك so know that none has the word right to be worshipped except Allah and seek forgiveness for your sins surah muhammad that's surah number 47 ayah 19 فبدا بالعلم قبل القول والعمل so he began with knowledge before speech and action اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب على كل مسلم ومسلمة تعلم ثلاث هذه المسائل والعمل بهن. No, may Allah have mercy upon you, that it is obligatory upon every male and female Muslim to gain knowledge of and act upon the following three matters. الأولى, the first, أن الله خلقنا ورزقنا ولم يتركنا حملا بل أرسل إلينا رسولا فمن أطاعه دخل الجنة ومن أصاعه دخل النار The first is that Allah, He created us, provided for us, and did not leave us without a purpose. Rather, He sent a Rasul, a messenger to us. So whoever shows obedience to Him will enter Jannah, and whoever sh shows disobedience toward Him will enter the fire. وَدَلِلُ قَالُهُ تَعَالَى and a proof of that is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna arsana ilaykum rasulan shahidan alaykum kama arsana ila fir'awna rasula. Fa'asa fir'awna rasula fa'akhadnahu akhdan wadila. Verily, we have sent you to a messenger to be a witness over you. As we did send a messenger to Pharaoh, but Pharaoh disobeyed the messenger. So we seized him with a severe punishment. That's Surah Al-Muzammil, the 73rd Surah, the 15th and 16th verses. So in this section, we have four, four, four terms we want to go over. The first is istighfar, seeking forgiveness. The second is Rasul, messenger. The third is Ta'a, obedience. And the fourth is Ma'fiya, disobedience. As for istighfar, seeking forgiveness, the scholars have explained that it's seeking to wipe away the sin, remove its effects, and protect from its evil consequences. Istighfar is generally synonymous with tawbah, which is repentance. However, when used in the same context, istighfar is seeking protection from the evil of what has already taken place of the sins, while tawbah is to retract and seek protection from the evil of what a person fears may take place in the future due to the negative effects of their actions. It is also said that when they are used in the same context, istighfar is seeking forgiveness with the tongue, while tawbah is renouncing the sins by way of the heart and limbs. As for the term rasul, messenger, a messenger has been explained by the scholars as a human man that has had a legislation revealed to him and he was ordered to convey it. As for the term ta'a, obedience, Ibn Abi Iz, Rahimahullah said, it is complying to the legislative commands of the religion. Ibn Abdul Bar, Rahimahullah said, obedience is only achieved through complying to what Allah and His Messenger commanded while seeking to gain a nearness to Allah, the mighty and majestic. Abdul Madafar, As-Sam'ani, Rahimahullah said, ta'a, obedience, is derived from ta'u and inqiyad voluntary compliance, and it is to embrace the command with acceptance. As for the term mafia, disobedience, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, it is opposing a legislative command. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Uqayyim rahimahullah said, fisk, wickedness, rebellion, sin, specifically applies to doing an act that is prohibited, and thus many things apply to it, like in the saying of Allah, the Most High. But if you do such harm, it will be for soap, wickedness in you. Surah Baqarah, Surah 2, Ayat 282. Well, ma'asiyah is to oppose or contradict a command. Back to the main text. Shaykh al-Islam, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab continues. When speaking about the four things that is obligatory upon every male and female Muslim to have knowledge and awareness of and act upon. He said, Athania, the second, 
أن الله لا يرضى أن يشتكى معه أحد في إبارته لا ملك مقرب ولا نبي مرسل He said Allah does not have pleasure or is not pleased with the fact that shirk a scribe and partners is set up with him in acts of ibadah, worship It does not matter it does not matter whether that be with an angel that is near to him or a messenger that was sent by him and the proof is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لَلَّهِ فَلَا تَدَعُوا مَا عَلَاهِ أَحَدٍ And the masajid, the places of worship or the places of prostration, are for Allah alone. So do not make dua to anyone along with Allah. الثالثة, the third, أَنَّ مَنْ أَطَاءَ الرَّسُولَ وَوَحَرَ اللَّهُ لَا يَجُوزُ لَهُ وَوَالَةُ مَنْ حَادَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ أَقْرَبُوا قَرِيبًا وَدَلِلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى He said the third, that anyone who is obedient to the messenger and singles out Allah and worship with Tawheed, that it is not permissible for that person to have muwala for those who oppose Allah and his messenger, even if it be their closest relative. The proof is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, لا تجد قوم يؤمنون بالله ويوم الآخر يواد دون من حاد الله والرسول ولو كانوا أباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيراتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيادهم بروح منه ويدخلهم جنة تجري من تحتها لنهار خالدين فيها رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه أولئك حزب الله ألا إن حزب الله هم المفلحون. الله سبحانه وتعالى says, you will not find the people who believe in Allah in the last day having love for and allegiance with those who oppose Allah and His Messenger, even if it be their fathers, their sons, their brothers, or their kindred. Those are the ones who Allah has written faith in their hearts and strengthened them with proof, light, and guidance from Him. And he will enter them into gardens under which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. Allah is pleased with them and they will they with him. They are the party of Allah. Indeed, the party of Allah are the successful. This is Surah, surah Al-Mujadila, the 58th Surah, the 22nd verse. In this section, we have six terms we want to go over. The first is Rida, pleasure. The second is Shirk. Ascribing partners to Allah or polytheism. The third is ibadah, worship. The fourth is masjid, which we translate sometimes as mosque or the place of worship. The fifth is dua, supplication or invocation to Allah. And the sixth is muwala, uh, love and allegiance. As for rida, pleasure, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymi. He explained in his book, Riyadh al-Salihin, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described with rida, pleasure. He is pleased with the action and the door, meaning Allah's pleasure has to do with the action and the door. Meaning Allah's pleasure has to do with the action and the door. As for the action, an example is his saying, وَإِن تَشْكُرُوا يَرْدَهُ لَكُمْ And if you be grateful, he is pleased therewith for you. Surah Zumar, the 39th Surah, Ayah 7. That is, he is pleased with your gratefulness. And as in his, the exalted saying, وَرَدِيتُ لَكُمْ إِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am pleased with Islam as your religion. Surah Ma'ida, that's Surah 5, Ayah 3. And as in the authentic hadith, Allah is pleased with three matters for you, and he detests three matters for you. This pleasure has to do with the action. And the pleasure is also with respect to the doer, as in the verse cited by Allah, رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه. I mean, cited by the authors, subhanAllah. رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. Surah Ma'idah, Surah 5, Ayat 119. Therefore, the pleasure of Allah is an attribute that is affirmed for Allah, the mighty and sublime. And it is about himself, 
It is not separate from him, as the people of Tattel denial claim. If someone says to you, explain the meaning of pleasure to me, you will not be able to explain it, because in the case of the people, it is an instinct, and it is not possible for a person to describe it better and clearer than with its expression. We therefore say pleasure is an attribute of Allah, the mighty and sublime, and it is a real attribute related to his mashia, his will, and it is among the attributes of doing. He is pleased with the believers and with those who have taqwa, and with the just and with those who are grateful. He is not pleased with the disbelievers. He is not pleased with the rebellious people, and he is not pleased with the hypocrites. So he, glorified and exalted as he, is pleased with some people, and he is not pleased with some people. He is pleased with some deeds, and he does not like some deeds. Describing Allah with pleasure is affirmed by the evidence of the, of the revealed text as preceded and with intellectual evidence. The fact that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, rewards those who are obedient, and compensates for them for their deeds and their obedience is proof for pleasure. So if you say using rewards as you do as evidence for the pleasure of Allah, the mighty and sublime is debatable because Allah, he may give the rebellious more favors than he gives to the grateful person. And this is a strong point. But the reply to that is his giving the rebellious person who is insistent on his obedience is a trap for him. And it is not done out of pleasure. As he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And for those who belie our ayat, we shall gradually seize them with punishment in ways that they perceive not. And I respite them. Certainly my plan is strong. As Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, Ayat 182. And for more on this point, I refer you back to the lecture, The Fruits of Taqwa. The description of Rida, a pleasure with regards to humans. Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, said, Rida is the heart being comfortable with the occurrence of the rulings. Ibn al-Arabi, rahimahullah, said, Rida, or pleasure, is the soul being comfortable with the preordainment and divine decree. As-Safarini, rahimahullah, said, Rida, or pleasure, is the comfort of the heart and it being at ease with the choice of Allah for the slave in a manner that he understands that he chose for him that which is best. Therefore, the slave is pleased with it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, or him Allah, he said, Rida, or pleasure, has types. Being pleased with acts of obedience, this we are commanded with, and it is obligatory. Being pleased with calamities, this we are commanded with, and it is either highly recommended or obligatory depending on the situation. And being pleased with kubr, kufr, disbelief, and fusuk, evil or wickedness, this we are not commanded to be pleased with. Rather, we are commanded to hate and despise it. al Hafiz ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah, said, Being pleased with the rububiyah, the lordship, or the rububiyah means the lordship, that Allah is the only Lord, creator, sustainer, provider, and manager of the creation. So, I just want to clarify that meaning. Being pleased with Rububiyah of Allah consists of being pleased with the worship of Him alone without ascribing any partners to Him, and being pleased with His management of the affairs of the servant and His choices for Him. Being pleased with Islam as a way of life requires one to prefer it over every other way of life. Being pleased with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a messenger requires being pleased with everything he came with from Allah while accepting it with full submission and comfort. As for the term shirk, or ascribing partners to Allah, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, rahimahullah said, The asl, the root, foundation of shirk is making Allah's creation equal to him in any aspect of what he alone deserves. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Qayyim, Rahimullah said, Shirk is making Allah equivalent to other than him in speech, intent, or belief. Imam Sa'adi, Rahimullah said, The reality of ascribing partners to Allah is worshipping the creation in the same manner that Allah is worshipped, or venerating the creation in the same manner that Allah is venerated, or turning toward the creation in any way from those peculiar aspects of rububiyah, lordship, and ilahiyah, servitude. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, whoever makes others equal to Allah in anything from his 
subhanahu wa ta'ala special characteristics, then he is a polytheist. Imam al-Shawqani said, rahimahullah, rather shirk is doing anything for other than Allah that should be specifically for him. Glorified is he. Shaykh Salih al-Fawzan, hafidahullah, said, it is making partners with Allah the Most High and his lordship or the sole right of servitude. As for the term ibadah, worship, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, ibadah is a comprehensive term which comprises of everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from statements and actions, those that are apparent as well as those that are hidden. At Tabari, Rahimahullah said, Ibadah is yielding obediently to Allah with complete submission. Ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah said, Legislatively, Ibadah or worship consists of a combination of complete love, submission, and fear. As for the term masjid, that most English people speak and know as a mosque. Sheikh al Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah said, Every place that the prayer is intended to be offered, can be considered a masjid. Rather, every place that is prayed in can be considered a masjid. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, the place that is considered a masjid is the place where the five prayers and other than them are offered as the masajid were built for that purpose. The place that is considered a masjid is the place where only worship of Allah and supplication to him is intended to be performed in it. The permanent committee for Islamic Verdicts, which is a committee or a body of kibar ulama, major scholars, they have said the masjid, according to the language, is a place of prostration. Legislatively, it is every place that has been situated for the purpose of the five congregational prayers of the Muslims to be offered in it. It may also be applied to that which is more general than that. So it includes the place a man establishes in his house and order to offer the voluntary prayers or the obligatory prayers when he has a valid legislated excuse that prevents him from being from offering them in congregation in the masjid that the people established the congregation in. As for the term dua, supplication, Al Khatabi, Rahimahullah said, the meaning of dua is the servant supplicating to his Lord, the mighty and majestic, out of need and seeking aid and support from him alone. The true nature of this dua is the servant manifesting iftipar, absolute need and dependence upon him, while acknowledging his total lack of power or capability. Dua is a sign of obudia, or servitude, and demonstrates the submissive role of mankind. Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimullah said, Dua has two parts. Dua al-ibadah, the supplication as an act of ibadah in and of itself, and dua al-mas'ala, the supplication that entails a request. Dua al-mas'ala is the supplicant seeking what is beneficial or seeking to remove and or repel what is harmful for him. Al-Hafiz ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, said, sometimes the dua is a request to Allah, the mighty and majestic, and begging him. Like the supplicant saying, oh Allah, forgive me, oh Allah, have mercy upon me. Sometimes dua is through fulfilling the means that lead to obtaining that which is sought. This is done by remaining busy in obedience to Allah and being mindful of him and what he requires of his servants to do. This is the true reality of iman or faith. At Tabi, Rahimahullah said, dua is manifesting extreme tabalul, submission, and iftiqar, absolute dependence to Allah while yielding to him. As for the term tawheed, or singling out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in aspects of lordship, the fact that he alone should be worshipped, and in his names and attributes. As Safar Rani, rahimahullah, said, Tawheed is singling out the one worthy of worship and acts of worship while believing that he is unique in his essence, attributes, and actions. As Dorazak Afifi, rahimahullah, said, Tawheed is singling out Allah and lordship, the sole right of servitude, and his names and attributes. Imam Masadi, rahimahullah, said the comprehensive term Tawheed is linked to all of its various aspects. It is the belief and faith of the slave in the oneness of the Rub, the Lord, and his perfect attributes while singling out him out in all forms of worship. As for the term Al-Muwala, 
having love and allegiance. Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, he said, the asl, meaning the origin or foundation of muwala is love, aid, and friendship. He, rahimahullah, also said, the asl, the root or foundation of muwala is love and mu'ada, having some enmity for the sake of something. These two things lead to the actions of the heart and the limbs, those actions that enter into the actualization of muwala and mu'ada, like support, friendliness, and aid, or struggling, and hijra, migration, and the likes of these things from the actions. And we bring for extra benefit the definition of muwala to kufa, having love and allegiance with the disbelievers. Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah said, what is intended by this is agreeing with the disbelievers in their disbelief, showing love for them and aiding them against the Muslims, and embellishing their actions while showing obedience and compliance to their disbelief. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah, said, Nothing is hidden from him in the heaven or earth or whatever it may be. So how can it be hidden from him those people who take the disbelievers as friends and protectors instead of the Muslims? He knows what is in your breast from inclining toward them with love and affection or what you do for them of assistance through actions and speech. He, Rahimahullah, also said, whoever befriends the Jews and Christians instead of the believers, then he is to be considered one of them. The Permanent Committee for Religious Verdicts said, the love and allegiance for the disbeliever that a person is considered to be committing an act of disbelief due to it is loving them and aiding them against the Muslims. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, said, this hatred, enmity, and willful separation from whatever is worship other than Allah is an affair that is found in the heart, on the tongue, and upon the limbs, just as love of Allah and allegiance to him and, and to his close allies is an affair that is found in the heart, on the tongue, and upon the limbs. Um, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made easy for me for right now. Inshallah, we'll continue on our next session with the rest of the book. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika. شروع لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم